Our guest today is Bruce Pardy, member of the Ontario Bar, professor of law at Queen's University, and uh, executive director of Rights Probe, a division of the Energy Probe Research Foundation, and their website is rightsprobe.org. I encourage people to go there to have a look at Bruce's work. Hi, Bruce. Hello again. Hello, Robert. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Uh, I've interviewed Bruce uh, on two different occasions, and people can, if they're interested, go to our website and have a look at um, those interviews as well, a couple of years ago now. Um, Bruce presented at the National Citizens Inquiry, which is currently touring Canada, trying to get the opinions of people affected by the um, actions of our governments, both provincial, municipal, and federal, of course, um, about uh, re re surrounding the COVID uh, pandemic. And some of the testimony today has been horrific to listen to, to say the least, or really heart-wrenching. Now, Bruce presented um, asking the question, why did the legal system fail to protect our civil liberties during COVID? So Bruce, before we begin our discussion, perhaps you can, because I, I want to discuss this in detail, things like rights or charter rights, um, our constitution, the law, the courts, the parliament. So give us please um, a synopsis of your presentation that you give at the National Citizens Inquiry and then we can get into the nitty gritty. Uh, th th thanks, Robert. I will try my best to be succinct. Uh, this question that I tried to address during COVID, why did the legal system fail to protect civil liberties? And there may be many ways to answer that question, but I focused on two. The first one is that this is a symptom. The whole COVID debacle is a symptom of the triumph of the administrative state. And then second, why didn't the charter step in and fix it all? Well, because the charter, the way it has been drafted and then the way it has been interpreted and applied by courts does not now oppose the premise of the administrative state. And we can get into both of those things. I'll, I'll address the administrative state first. So we have a basic idea in our system of governance. I mean, we have many basic ideas, but one of the basic ideas is the idea of a separation of powers between the three branches of the state. And the three branches are the legislature, which legislates, of course, the courts, which adjudicate, of course. And then the third branch, which is the administration or the executive branch of government. And one of the reasons for having a separation of powers is to protect us all from a concentration of power. The separation of powers means that the legislature is not supposed to be dealing with particular cases. So you know, if the government doesn't like you, it's not going to be able to legislate a specific law just for you. It legislates general rules. And then courts don't have carte blanche to do whatever they want. They have to take the rules created by the legislature and apply them to particular cases. And then this third, this third branch, the administration, the basic rule about their powers is that they have no power. No power except the authority given to them by the legislature in a statute. So that's all fine and good, except that what has happened more in, in, in modern times, and it's not just modern times, it's not just COVID, this has been in, in development for a long, long time. But what has happened is that the separation of powers between these three branches is starting to dissolve. Legislatures, instead of passing rules and statutes, often now delegate their rulemaking authority to the administration. Courts, instead of watching over what the administration does and making sure they have a mandate to do what they do, the courts now, and, and not across the board and not absolutely, but courts are inclined now to defer to the authority of the bureaucrats and officials and experts inside the administrative branch of government. So you have delegation from the legislative branch, you have deference from the judicial branch, and as a result, what you get in the administrative branch is the discretion 
to decide what the public interest is. And that is what I call the, the holy trinity of the administrative state. Delegation, deference, and discretion. And that means that when, when you know, we have spent our time during COVID uh, discussing things like uh, whether or not lockdowns are effective or whether or not the vaccines have been tested properly or whether or not masks work, we are really questioning whether or not the policies adopted by the administrative branch of government are in the public interest. Now, that's a fair question. It's legitimate. We want to know the answer to these questions, of course. But we're sort of missing the point because the premise of the administrative state is that officials have the discretion to decide the public interest. So the fact that we might disagree is really not that important. They have the discretion to decide that. And until you challenge that premise. I think most other things in governance terms are, are just arguing in the margins and not getting at the central reason why we got into the debacle that we did. So that's the short version of the, the administrative state problem. The short version of the charter problem is this. The charter appears to be a roster of individual rights and freedoms is certainly drafted that way. It looks to be solid. It's th these rights and freedoms are stated in black and white. It's a constitutional document. People think that it's there to protect them and it will protect them and it hasn't. And you know, why, why is that? Uh, it, it's partly because of the way the text is worded. It's partly because of the way courts have interpreted those words over time. Uh, it, it is a myth, I'll start with this, it's a myth that our legal system starts with the charter. The charter is not the foundation of our system of government or our system of law. Uh, it's really just a gloss on the things the legislatures and executive agencies can do. Um, one of the foundations is this idea that I mentioned, the separation of powers, but even that is starting to, to, to dissolve. And in its place is this holy trinity of the administrative state, delegation, deference, and discretion. Um, but what happened with respect to charter rights during COVID, I like to put it this way. Governments and agencies and public health officials went around the back door. They went through the gaps. They did indirectly what the charter might not have allowed them to do directly. So here's an example. If the public health officials or the government or, 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 or the ministry or whoever had decided to impose a literal vaccine mandate, as in you will be vaccinated or we will fine you or throw you in prison, okay? Now that's, in legal terms, that's an actual coercive mandate. And we have section seven of the charter, which guarantees life, liberty, and security of the person. And it is likely, I would like to think, that that kind of actually compulsory vaccine mandate would, would breach section seven of the charter. And then we go to section one, section one is the reasonable limits. And you know who knows what's going to happen uh, in that stage of the analysis in a courtroom, uh, Section 1 is, 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 is a big, broad exception, broad enough to drive a truck through. But nevertheless, you'd start with the proposition that that kind of literal vaccine mandate would violate Section 7 of the chart. But that's not what we had. What we had was policies that looked coercive, but were actually voluntary. You needed a vaccine passport to go to a restaurant. You might have needed a shot to keep your job. Your, your, you know, your, uh, and the like. Vaccine mandates to go here and there to travel on a plane or or a train, and the and the the version of this that you heard from government was, well, you don't have to. It is still your choice, but choices have consequences, and if you choose not to get a vaccine, 
Well, then maybe you can't fly in a plane. Maybe you can't keep your job. Maybe you can't go to a restaurant, but it's your choice. And therefore, it's not compulsory in the legal sense. And therefore, it's not a violation of the charter. And legally, that's not a bad argument. The comparison that I like to use is with the no shirt, no shoes, no service rule. So let's say government creates a rule that applies to retail establishments that says you can't go into a store or a restaurant without a shirt and shoes. And let's say there's somebody who doesn't want to wear a shirt and shoes and they say, well, I have the right to bodily autonomy. You can't make me put stuff on my body. And that's true. But the response is, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to go into the store. You don't have, don't have to go into the restaurant. You don't have the right to demand to behave as you wish anywhere you are. The rest of society agrees or essentially agrees that we don't want people bare chested in a restaurant or a variety store. So it might be a violation of a type, but it's not a charter violation. You have the right to decide not to do it. And this is the same argument being made with respect to the vaccines. You saw this echoed in, in uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, comments most recently about how he didn't actually require anybody to take a vaccine. That's echoing this argument. Yes, we had policies to encourage people to take a vaccine, to enable them to do things that we didn't actually require. And the experience in the courts over, over COVID with respect to challenges about all kinds of things, including vaccines, were largely unsuccessful for these kinds of reasons. Not exclusively. There are all kinds of variations, of course, in the nature of the cases and the reasons that the courts gave. But, but the resort to the charter was largely unsuccessful because the policies fit in the gaps. They did indirectly what maybe could not have been done directly, or in other situations, the court found that although it, the particular policy did violate a charter right, like the prohibiting of gathering in churches and so on, they did violate the freedom of association, maybe the freedom of religion. Nevertheless, they were justified under Section 1. So there's a whole host of variations, but, but the bottom line is that the Charter has not responded, and it has not responded to these violations of civil liberties for, for understandable reasons, even if we don't like them. Now, there's a, a question that just popped into my mind that I have not heard asked anywhere recently about this situation. And that is that, yes, the individual um, customer um, is not necessarily legally having his rights violated because he has a choice. But the businessman, and by businessman, I mean corporations as well. <laughs> For example, an airline, they're forced they're mandated to say that you cannot let anybody on your plane unless they get jabbed. The, the local drugstore, the, the, the tobacconist, you know, the bear store, they're forced to put up barriers. They're forced to have lanes in their, their um, aisles that people must follow. They're forced to force people to wear masks if they want to choose to go into their store. So while yes, the customer, uh, that argument can be debated about whether or not their rights are violated, but the businessman unquestionably is being forced by law to do these things or they'll shut them down. And we've yes. seen yes. restaurants have been shut down for not obeying these things. And by restaurants, I mean the owners, the individual. Yes. Their right to their liberty. Yes. Their a living has been violated, in my opinion, because of the forced coercion by the state. What do you think? Oh, oh I entirely agree. So if, if you have one of these rules that, let's go back to the no shirt, no shoes, no service rule. Let, let's say that that is not the choice of the proprietor of the corner store. Let's say that it is a rule that the government has promulgated. If that's the case, then the liberty of the owner of the store has been taken away to decide for himself what rules he wants to apply to his premises. Maybe he doesn't want to bar people for not wearing shoes, but his ability to do, to do that has been removed. And so the same thing with, with these various COVID rules. But, but a lot of these rules have the effect of, of, of 
dictating what you do on your own property, if you're a restaurant owner, for example. And that is not a charter right. There is no property protection in the charter. There's a there. It's, it's listed in the Bill of Rights, but that's mostly toothless and useless for the most part. Uh, the, and, Could you and, not say, Bruce, that it is in the charter under the word liberty? Because liberty is never ever be discussed or defined in their charter, and I, you can tell me whether or not it's been defined in law, but I don't find it discussed at all when it comes to as as a right liberty no, nobody really knows what you mean by that but to me it means being able to use my property as long as i'm not interfering with anybody else's right you know uh, what do you think well yes i mean one would like liberty to be given that meaning but but the but the narrow meaning of liberty that has been explored most in the context of that section is the liberty not to be locked away in other words, you're 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 you 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 are at liberty, or you are confined, and mm -hmm. and the and the section seven target. I think the the, the courts have approached I mean, most most of the liberty cases under section seven are about when the when the court can 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 basically imprison you without due process, and mm -hmm. that's that's primarily the the situation that section seven has been held so far to to apply to in the, in the liberty sense anyway. I mean, liberty, the fact that you have a liberty right in section seven doesn't mean you can go anywhere you want. I mean, doesn't, no. the fact that you have liberty in the, in the charter does not mean you can, you know, walk onto the tarmac at the airport or, or, or go into the stadium without a ticket or, or walk across the highway. I mean, you, you, you it's the liberty idea in the charter does not mean that the government is not able to make rules that govern where you go and on what terms. If they lock you away without charge and without due process, well, then, okay, you got a case now. But, but liberty, you know, so far has not been held to mean the kind of liberty that, you know, the, the classical liberals and the libertarians would, would like to see enshrined in the charter. That's fascinating because I, I don't recall, maybe you can cite chapter and verse or case um, where liberty has been narrowly defined in that sense like you are at liberty and like a, a, if you were a, a soldier right you're given liberty to go off base and to enjoy yourself but then right. you have to come back to base so that's what right. it means in a very narrow uh, definition of um right liberty. you see what you see what happens to all of these rights so you start with this idea but then almost immediately we have to talk about well what does it actually mean and what are the boundaries? So you can do this, you can do the same kind of, of, of analysis with freedom of speech, right? Freedom of speech, section, section two, you have freedom of speech, but that doesn't mean you can say anything you want because there are very well established exceptions to that. I mean, some of them are principled exceptions, some of them are not, but the principled exceptions, I would argue, consist of those situations in which your speech is something more than speech and is violating somebody else's other kind of right. So for example, people have the right generally to be free of your violence. So if you go up to them on the street and you say, I'm going to beat your head in unless you give me your wallet. Well, that's speech and you have freedom of speech, but you're not free to say that because that constitutes an assault, a, a threat of imminent violence. Or if you go in the newspaper and you write um, uh, false things about what I've done to, I don't know, to, to cheat on my taxes. That's also speech. You have freedom of speech, but you don't have the freedom to defame because now you're violating somebody else's right. So the fact that these things are written in the charter does not mean that they are absolute rights. And there are going to be situations where all of them are curbed, hopefully in some kind of principled way, uh, but as often as not in the modern era, you just have, you know, new legislation or government rules that 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 curb them in some other way that the courts may or may not decide is a is a justifiable limitation. Uh, hate speech laws probably fall into that. For example, I don't think that a person yeah. has a right not to be offended. And yet that is being used um, to to curtail speech or to give consequence to speech which would otherwise not be um, consequential. So, yeah, right. I can see where the pendulum is swinging towards um, towards an end that we don't want to see happen. 
a very broad, as you can say with um, section one, you can drive a truck through a lot of these things and they're driving those trucks through right. these crosses. Right, right. And, and in addition to this, you have the this 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 first point, which is that the the courts and the Supreme Court in particular, and this is not just this Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court as an institution over a period of time, seems to have embraced the necessity for the administrative state. That is, they regard the administrative state and its need to manage things as legitimate and therefore has an inclination to, to interpret the words of the Charter and other parts of the Constitution in light of its necessity to deal with society in a particular way to produce outcomes which are in the public interest. Once you have that premise, then the scope of these rights is, is probably defined accordingly. If you were to start with the premise that the administrative state as it has become is perhaps not such a great idea, then one might be inclined to interpret these, these, these provisions differently. There is the, the three, the Holy Trinity, you were saying discretion, delegation, deference, but there was another point that you brought up during your testimony to the National Citizen Inquiry, and that was mootness. Right. Uh, could you explain? Sure. Yes. So the job of courts is to resolve actual cases. If you went to a court and said, you know, I have a question. I have a question. I have this, this scenario in my head. I don't know what would happen. Will you please resolve it for me? They would tell you to go away because it's not a real case. It's hypothetical. And they don't, they don't do hypothetical, hypothetical cases. It's a waste of judicial resources. They don't have time. It's not a real thing. They just won't entertain your, your, your situation. Mootness is a situation where uh, an actual case, a real case between real parties with a real problem, becomes a theoretical case because something changes. Let's say there's a challenge to a rule. And the person challenging the rule, you know, complains about the rule because it's causing this kind of a problem for them. And then the rule goes away. And the, uh, the, the, the description of that is, well, the rule's gone away. Your, your case is now moot. That is as it's not real anymore. It's just a theoretical question. And courts will generally not hear cases that are moot. However, they do have the discretion to do so. And they exercise that discretion in accordance with with a, with a test that's been developed in the case law. And, and so it's not an absolute thing, but they also don't want to waste their time hearing and deciding cases that don't matter anymore. And, and one of the examples of this was the challenge to the, uh, the, the, the vaccine travel mandate of the federal government, uh, which was dismissed for being moot once the, once the rule was, was, was repealed. But what that leaves us with are these very big questions about the scope of the government's power to order us what or order us around and tell us what to do. We don't know if that was legal or not. And so the difficulty here is that if the court declines to exercise its discretion to hear these cases once the rule goes away, then it is possible that the government will think that it has the authority and to do it again the next time around. This isn't the first time I've heard of mootness. I remember many years ago in London, Ontario, a person, th this, um, this points to the um, individual versus the government in this case of mootness. This individual had AIDS and he had unprotected sex with people and he didn't inform them mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, they take him to court because they are injured by his actions but he subsequently dies while it's still, you know, in front of the judge. And so it's thrown out for mootness, right? These people, you know, he's, he can't be found guilty after he's dead type of thing, right? Well, that's true. Sure. Whether, yeah, you, you, whether or not yeah, they use yeah. the word mootness or not, but I think that that's probably the principle in, involved here. But what we have with the government... Well, it's not quite, it's not quite the same thing. It, it, I mean, yeah. depending upon what kind of a suit it was. I mean, if he was being prosecuted, then, then sure, because you can't prosecute a dead person. So it's moot in that sense, but it's really the, the lack of, a, of an accused, which is, which is similar, I grant you, but it's, it's not exactly the same thing. Not exactly the same. And I think that's my point in the sense that with government, it's perpetual. 
right? They're not going to die. No, right, right. <laughs> They'll always be right, there. Sure. The, the names and the faces change, but the perpetrators are always going to be there. Right. So sure. So so if you like, here is one of the premises of the, the, the mootness discretion on the part of the courts. The, the premise, I think, and it's not articulated this way, but the premise is to assume good faith on the part of the government. Now, if you took the opposite tact and assumed bad faith on the part of the government, you can make this argument. You say, well, if you have this mootness rule, then here's what the government can do. They can put in place some kind of draconian rule and somebody can challenge it in court and courts are you know, pretty slow sometimes. You can get things on an expedited basis occasionally, but sometimes it's slow. And the government can calculate that they're going to keep the rule in place until the moment before the case is heard by the court. And then once the, 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 the case is taken up, we'll get rid of the rule, we'll cause the case to be moot, the court will dismiss it, and as soon as it's dismissed, we'll put the rule back on. And then the same thing again and again and again. Now, hopefully, eventually, the court would say, well, you know, they're, they're, they're playing cat and mouse here with us. We'll hear this case. But that's the potential for governments in this kind of COVID situation. The fact that they took all the rules down just in time for the, to avoid the court looking at them means that there's no court judgment now saying that all these, these extreme things that they did didn't have lawful authority. We, we, we don't have that opportunity. Um, could you apply what you're talking about when it re refers to government, delegation, deference, and mootness, putting aside discretion at the moment, and apply it to what we've seen in, in individuals and how they've responded in the last few years to the actions of government? And I, I'm talking about we delegate our fact-finding and knowledge to organizations like the news media, journalists. Yeah. We defer to the experts, <laughs> you know, right. when it comes to medical officers of health or colleges of physicians and surgeons who may be comprised of people who aren't even physicians and surgeons. And after all is said and done, we seem to forgive and forget, at least a lot of us do. This points to mootness. If I go to a person on the street now and we want to talk about what happened during these last dreadful three years, a lot of people would just go, it's over, move on. That's right to them. Right. Interesting. Yes. It's interesting parallel. Yeah. So it, yeah. it holds, does it? The deference, delegation and mootness seems to be a disease, not only of uh, corporate Canada, but the governance, but also of individuals. That's my that's my opinion. Anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an interesting way to put it. Uh, the 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 so the difference for me between the two situations is that that well, bottom line is people can do what they want, and it doesn't affect anybody else. If you want to delegate your thinking uh, to the news media, if you want to uh, you know the, defer your judgment to the public health officials, well, I mean. Not what I would recommend, but you're allowed. Yes. Uh, whereas, and, and, and you know, it might have an overall effect if 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 lots and lots of people do the same thing, then you get a population just following direct uh, directives from from these institutions, which is not a good thing. But we they're free people, they're right? They're free people, and if they want to be sort of intellectually lazy like that then they 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 can be i it's it's unfortunate uh and it's not the kind of thing that we need to happen in a society that that purports to be free on the other hand it's a lot of work right i mean to, to yeah. be to be a free citizen here's one of the here's one of the misnomers i think that we we uh suffer from a, a misconception a misconception that we are owed the truth from the news media, from the government, from whoever you can think of. We are owed the truth. In a free country, that's probably not true. In fact, I think the premise in a free country should be the opposite, that whatever you hear from the news media, from government officials, or as the case may be, you should assume it's wrong. You know, you should hear it with skepticism and, and understand that 
that your job as a free citizen is to think these things through for yourself. And if you don't take that on and you, and you delegate and defer, well, then you sort of get what you deserve. Yeah, I don't bring it up necessarily as an attack on a person's right to, to think for themselves or anything like that, or not in a legal sense, but in more in a psychological sense. I think right. that we, right. it's right. an identification of human nature to be intellectually uh, lazy. I think that's fair. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we could touch on some of the aspects of the Constitution, uh, the preamble to our Constitution uh, says, whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law, mm. you have these rights, which we can take away. Um, a good friend right. of both of ours, yes. Salim Mansur, has mm -hmm. suggested in a substack of his that we add these words and in doing so, bring the Constitution back to the people rather than Parliament or the Crown. And that is, at the end of that statement, simply put in, um, derived from the will of the people. Because in constitutions like in the United States, or at least in the founding documents, they have, we the people. Mm -hmm. In uh, India, it says, we the people of India do proclaim these things. Mm -hmm. That we're a socialist state, <laughs> which is true. Um, but in Canada, nowhere nowhere in our founding documents or constitution does it say that the the people are sovereign and that all of our rights come from us and are not to be imposed or um, given to us as liberties mm -hmm. they're inalienable to us and we give parliament power that's not here that's not this country can a comment on that sure yes so the articulation of our form of government, I think, does tend to be more paternalistic than the examples that you cited in the US and India and so on. But I'm not sure that it has practical implications because the, the US, for example, is in a lot of trouble in many of these same respects as well. So yes, I'm not, I'm not against articulating that notion. But I'm not sure what difference it would make. It's more psychological, I think. It, it gives the people the, an understanding that Parliament is servant uh, is a servant of the people. Uh, true, um, it is often ignored, much like most of our rights are ignored. But I would um, posit that to have something like that puts a notion in people's minds that is not there right now. In the yes. United States, if you cross the border, yep. they have an, an implicit understanding of the role of government and the people more so than we do here i think and just having that kind of a statement in there as you're, you're correct that it's probably not practical but it is a psychological or philosophic that's, that's uh, fair and I, I and i do think there is uh, a, a a very healthy american skepticism about the power of government that we lack in this country so perhaps that would go some way to fixing that we do have a different a set of expectations in a, in, a, in a culture that, I mean, after all, after all, you know, we, we are the place where the people who did not want to rebel against the king came to. Uh, so as, you know, not, not to ruffle those feathers, if I could put it that way. So it might be that we come to our cultural sensibilities, honestly, even if they're not good ones, at least, as seen by you and I and other people like us, uh, I, 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 I think that notion is a healthy one that all government power derives from the people. But I think it can also be overdone because people can think in practical terms that it means more than it really does. It, we, we still do have in this country, like in the US and other democracies, the idea of democracy, which you know is not working very well, but nevertheless, there's at least elections. And if you didn't have that as the, as the practical application of the idea that the power comes from the people, then what would you use? Uh, people think, for, here's, here's another example. During COVID, one of the objections that I heard a lot from people who, who opposed all of these crazy policies was that the government hadn't shown us 
that what they were doing was correct. They hadn't shown us the evidence. They hadn't consulted with us. They hadn't passed it by us. They did it on their own accord. They did it on the basis of very poor science and so on. Where is the justification? And that, and that reflects a misconception about what government is and what powers it has. Once you win an election, you are, you are entitled to make laws and policies. And you don't have to justify them to anyone. That's the power of the legislature. If you have a body of elected, uh, uh, elected MPs or MPPs, and they, they, and they pass a statute, that statute can say anything as long as it's not unconstitutional. If it's not unconstitutional, that statute can do things that are silly, that are obtuse, that are objectionable, that have no backing in, the, in, in scientific uh, evidence. They can do anything they want as long as it's not unconstitutional and, of course, within their jurisdictional power to do. But, but there's no justification process required. That brings up the question of accountability, I think, which you touched upon at your uh, testimony. And that is, how do you hold accountable um, on both ends, the judiciary and the legislature, um, for the legislature's part, um, if they delegate their, uh, their uh, lawmaking to right. the executive branch, um, then how do you hold them accountable? And I'll give you an example. In the United States, the Obamacare Act, the Affordable Care Act, was 2,700 pages long. Right. Nobody read it. Right. right. Even right. the people who wrote it, wrote it in sections, so they didn't even read it. Right. That's right. because in the Constitution of the United States, Article 1 says that the legislative powers reside only within Congress. They don't reside with the executive. Right. Well, well, right, but we have the same principle. Oh, do we? It, we do have the same principle. That, that, that's where we start. That's that's where the separation of powers begins. So there is, and, and courts have said this many times uh, as a principle. The principle is that the executive branch of government, and, and a couple of exceptions, but let's not worry about the exceptions right now. As a general principle, the executive branch of government has no power to do anything except as is provided to them in a statute. And that's one reason, that's one rationale that our courts are given over time for allowing legislatures to delegate their lawmaking authority to the executive branch. They say, well, the executive branch has no power to do anything except those powers that are given to them in a statute. And these are powers given to them in a statute. The legislature has decided. Mm -hmm to delegate these powers to the executive branch. And we're not going to interfere with that because it's the legislature. It's elected. It's decided that's what it wants to do. So away you go. Well, I understand the principle. Yep. Yeah, um, for sure. As a matter of fact, there's, there are sound reasons sometimes for, for allowing that to happen, to sure. give the minister and his minister, you know, bureaucracy leeway to set regulations, right, as they occur, rather than going back to the legislature every time to 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 manage something that may have come up, you know. Well, as a practical matter, that's true. But 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 here's the problem. So the the further down that road you go in accepting that proposition, the further down the road of the administrative state and its necessity we go. So here's here's a competing philosophy, if you like, and it's a very impractical one in 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 present day what it appear to be. But here's the competing philosophy that that. Part of the rule of law, this is one thing that uh, Friedrich Hayek said, part, one of the characteristics of a robust rule of law is rules that are fixed and announced beforehand. That is, if you're a citizen, you should be able to go and look up the rules in the book, understand what they are, and then govern your behavior accordingly. What we don't want is governments making up rules on the fly because nobody knows what they are. No one knows what they're going to be tomorrow. You can't plan your own affairs on the basis of that kind of rulemaking. Sometimes they're not published. We don't know what the rationale was. There's no debate in public. You can't have the minister with the powers to do too many things other than to carry out, to, to, to execute. That's where the word comes from, the executive branch of government, to execute the rules as provided for in the statute. So here's a, here's, here's a good example of that model. In the criminal code, 
The rules are in the code. You know, if you've if you're accused of murder, then you know all you have to do is look up the definition of murder in the code, and you'll see what it says. And the requirements of the offense are in the definition. Now, not always certain. There's not not it's not that there's no gray, but that's the statement that the legislature has made about what's prohibited, as opposed to so many of the rules that apply to us today on a day to day basis that are in. I mean, regulations are one thing. Regulations are at least a little bit formalized. There's at least a formal process for making a regulation. There's also, you know, policies and guidelines and practices and and ad hocery. So many times in the in the here and now, we have officials of of all different kinds making all different kinds of decisions about what's in the public interest without really going through any public process about what 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 that result's going to be. And the more we accept the proposition that this is necessary to run a modern society, to manage a modern society, you're going to have things like COVID happen. I guess it's the excesses that we're addressing here rather than the rule necessarily. It's the overreach. I don't, I'm not sure that I agree. I, no. I think that if you, if you accept the premise of the administrative state, and then you are going to get overreach because... The premise is essentially that it is the job of people in the government, you know, the experts and the bureaucrats to manage society, to to fix social problems. I disagree. I do not agree that it is the role of people inside the government to fix social problems. What I think the role of government is, is to tell us what the general rules are that define the relationship between each one of us to the other. And between us and the state. If you have those general abstract rules that apply to everybody all the time, you know, rules of contract and rules of property and rules of process, then you really shouldn't need the kind of administrative state that we have now. I'm basically describing a what, what is sometimes called a night watchman state, a state that is there to keep the peace and to establish the basic principles and then otherwise leaves people alone to make their own way. Hmm. Sounds wonderful. Let's talk about the courts, because we talked about the legislature now, and um, but the courts um, disappoint me when they defer. Um, let, me, let me give an example. If, if I see some, if I'm a judge on a court and I see that somebody's rights are violated, and I'm presented by the government side that, um, oh, well, we did this because of these reasons, because this expert suggested that if we do this, lives will be saved or some other consequence, which would be beneficial to the group as a whole, would ensue. And so now the judge would see that, yes, person, this person's rights were violated. And in my mind, I'm not going to take away that expertise in person's rights. And the judge is an expert in law and an expert uh, what well, at least one would hope to be an expert in how and why people's rights are violated and the remedies that should happen because of that. It seems to me that a judge today in general are saying that, yes, your rights were violated. However, it's justifiable under Section 1, you know, in, in free and democratic society, which they've done, by the way, for example, um, uh, the, the marijuana laws, the cannabis laws, and um, what's his name? Um, Malmo and Levine, is it? Um, yes, Malmo Levine, um, Arab versus Malmo Levine, where they the judges in the Supreme Court said that, yes, your rights are violated. However, under Section 1, it's justifiable. Now, this is not war. This is not insurrection. But they're invoking Section 1 regarding somebody smoking pot. Remember, Brian Peckford stood on the steps, I think it was of the Supreme Court, during the Truckers' Freedom Convoy, mm -hmm. saying, uh, retrospectively, I might add, that uh, um, that Section 1, and he was there, was for war and insurrection and dangers to the existence of the state's existential you know, um, threats to the, to the well-being of the country as a, whole, as a nation. Mm -hmm. And yet we see it for marijuana laws. We've seen it for location of adult bookstores. 
um, for pro profanity, things of that nature. They're invoking this section one. I never heard Mr. Peckford, and we owe a lot to Brian Peckford. Don't Indeed. get it wrong. Yes. You certainly do. But I never heard him come out and vehemently stand on the steps of a courthouse and say, this is not what we meant. It's only when it came to a head with the Freedom Convoy that did Mr. Peckford come out and passionately say what Section 1 meant to the founding uh, fathers of that Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, your thoughts? Well, the, the problem is that that's not what it says. I mean, if you actually looked at the text of Section 1, it does not say, you know, in extreme situations of war and insurrection, then maybe you can violate one of these charter rights. It doesn't say that. True. It's reasonable limits in a free and democratic society. And so if you go back to one of my examples about free speech, you know, if, if there is a law on the books about assault in words or defamation, I mean, that's an exception to your freedom of speech. And that's not war. It's not insurrection. It's a reasonable limit. So are we suggesting that those would not be allowed, that, 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 that the legislature should not be allowed to pass a criminal prohibition that says you're not allowed to threaten imminent violence because, after all, you have freedom of speech? That's not really what we mean. And so you, you, this is often the case with the law. The, the, there are inherent ambigu ambiguities in language. And people read stuff and they think, well, there it is in black and white, therefore this. Well, there's nuance there and there's gray areas. What does it mean? What are the limits to what it means? What, you know, and, and so there's a process here of interpretation and application and precedent and so on. It's just that uh, certainly during COVID, but not just during COVID, the whole, you know, it, it seemed to only go in one direction. The courts seemed determined to accept the government narrative about things that seemed determined to uphold the validity of the rules that were, to me anyway, clearly violating uh, what would otherwise have been charter rights. Um, here's the bottom line. It is difficult to, to dictate outcomes that are in opposition to your culture. Law is a product of culture. And if you're expecting a document to hold back the culture, that's probably not going to happen. And so, and we, I, we, don't want to, we don't want to paint this inaccurately, too. It is not the case that the courts have suddenly declined to enforce any charter rights. That is just not true. They enforce charter rights all the time. But if you look at the pattern over the, over the long period, the pattern, I think, tends to be that they take an expansive interpretation of rights when the cause tends to be a progressive one. Hmm. For example, gay marriage. Gay marriage was a thing that the courts did, not the legislature. The courts did it. But when it came to COVID, as often as not, instead of reading these rights in an expansive way, they read them in a narrow way, saying, well, it doesn't really say that, does it? So you can't do that. So you, you can't have this right because it doesn't exist because that's not what they said. So, so it's, it's a selective use of a textual approach to the charter versus you know, an expansive uh, living tree approach. Living tree when it suits and a textual narrow approach when it suits. And, and, and you know, I guess that comes back to the culture thing. And I'm glad you said that because, of course, um, when it comes down to it, in any society, if you read the constitution of uh, communist China, there are rights listed, yes, enumerated right. in there. Exactly. Of course, they're violated every day because right. the person who right. owns the guns sets the rules and can right. enforce them the way, whatever the way they want. So would our Charter of Rights and Freedoms and our constitution and this, um, this whole 800 years of common law precedent is it all a facade doesn't it all just come down to listen we're in power we got here legitimately we got the guns you do as we say we'll kill you it's not that absolute but there is there is something to it in this sense i mean what one of the ways to define law is to say that it is 
a political language that legitimizes political decisions. It's an that's a sort of an anthropological explanation for it. That that the substance of it is less in the substance and more in the ritual than anything else. I mean, there are so many um, pieces of the law out there in statutes and court decisions and so on that you could show up to the light and think, well, that doesn't make any sense, or that's inconsistent with that. If if we start with the premise that the law is solid, it's logical, it makes sense, it's internally coherent, and it, it's it's substantive in that sense of it, it, it is the thing that determines everything, well, I don't think that's true. Uh, there are so many counterexamples to those propositions that it just doesn't hold together. It's a political language that legitimizes social outcomes. Fascinating and profound. Um, the final topic that I'd like to ask your opinion on, Bruce, is the difference between civil rights, charter rights, and inalienable rights. And I bring it up, and it only occurred to me when I was just going through rights uh, probe, and I noticed, and I rewatched your presentation to the National Citizens Inquiry, where you talk about civil rights. You mention it in your um, presentation. Right. Could you please define for me or dif differentiate the different, you know, what is the difference between a civil right, a charter right, and an inalienable right? Right. So I, I, so I'd like to refer to the first idea as civil liberties. Maybe it doesn't make any difference, but, but here's the problem when you use the word right. Right is a term of art in the law. It means a certain thing. There's a, there's a legal saying that goes, there's no right without a remedy. Meaning if you actually have a right, a legal right, and it's been breached, well, then you can go to a court and get a remedy for it. But the opposite also applies. If you go to a court looking for a remedy for the breach of your right, and the court says, sorry, no remedy for that, that means that legally you had no right. The right that you claimed, sorry, doesn't exist. And so when, 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 when we speak, when we in the law speak of rights, we're speaking of actual concrete things that courts will act upon. And that's to contrast with it, with, with what a lot of people talk about, you know, quite rightly, talking about the, their inalienable rights. They're, those are rights that they think they ought to have, or in a moral sense, do have. In a moral, philosophical sense, absolutely do have. But not necessarily legally. And one has to make the clear distinction and, and identify what you're talking about. Are you talking about a moral argument or a historical argument? or a philosophical argument, or a legal argument. Because a lot of the rights that people are, are, are adamant that they have in those realms, and fair enough, you go to a court, you'll get nowhere, because they're not legal rights. And so I use the term civil liberties to describe those things that, in my opinion, people should be at liberty to do. And so uh, using that, use, approaching in that way allows one to say, we had all these civil liberties that were violated during COVID, and yet we couldn't get them recognized as charter rights. The, the two, two, two different categories of things. I guess that um, the word inalienable is rather alien to a lot of Canadians. In the United States, they may have a little bit more of a, a gut reaction to it. But to me, it simply means it doesn't come from the other. In other words, my rights are not given to me. Just because they're not enumerated in a constitution or by my government doesn't mean that I don't have them. From a well, it means you don't. It, it, it means it doesn't mean you don't have them again in the moral, philosophical, um, God-given sense. I grant you that, hmm. but but you're now speaking a different language than the law, and and the in the alienable rights that we think that we have will be of no purchase inside a courtroom. Do you think then perhaps a constitution as a living document needs to, like even in the American sense, that was a living document, they amended it, right? Sure. It, wasn't, sure. it wasn't written in stone. They, they made changes to it. Right. 
But in, in our constitution, um, if you look, think of all of the documents that went together in putting together Canada right. from 1867 on, or even before, right? it's always changed. 1982, we adopted our own Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That That's in living memory. I certainly remember when the Queen came over and signed it. With oh, the- me too. Yeah. Um, so it changes all the time. And again, with common law and, and case law, it starts to build up and change the way that our relationship with the state um, is over time. Do you think that, how would you like to see this road go down? Do you want to see a more, um, our, our documents and our legal system become more in line with what we as individuals think of as inalienable rights? Or do you see us going down a, a pattern of um, more of a Napoleonic code where this is written, this is the way it is, mm-hmm. you must obey, mm-hmm. and it's not going to get changed? Um, what would you prefer? Oh, well, I mean, I would, I would love to see changes to our Constitution. I would love to see them go in the direction that you're describing, embracing the idea of 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 individual rights and liberties. Uh, people have made the observation that the charter is more akin to a, a continental code than it is like a common law uh, set of set of propositions. Uh, but 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 the problem practically is that. If you were to, if we were to find a way to open up the Constitution to revision, I mean, it's, we have some very challenging amending formulas that we'd have to meet that's that are embedded in the in the in the document. But even if you found a way to do that, and with with, with the objective of of changing the Constitution in some very important ways, the danger is that if you open it up because of the state of the culture right now and the state of the views of the of the establishment of the prevailing order about what government is for and the and the triumph of the administrative state the likelihood is that once you open it up it's going to get worse not better it is a it is a product of culture and if your culture is in a bad state you're not going to be able to amend it so as to push the culture back the culture is going to embrace it and make it reflect what the what the what the flavor of the day is and the flavor of the day is that experts and officials have the have the authority and and expertise to manage society and tell us what to do that's where we're at that's the problem with the administrative state and you could you could make it worse you can open up the document and incorporate that proposition into an even worse kind of section 1 and you'd be left in a in a in a worse situation you are now than you are now. So our task is daunting, isn't it? We have to change culture to change law. Yeah, uh, yeah, easily done. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Always a pleasure, Bruce. Thank you very much. I love your insight. And um, people should go to your website, rightsprobe.org, to find out more about Bruce Party and the work he's been doing. A lot of videos there. A lot of food for thought. Thank you once again, Bruce. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it.